you probably had some folks that because that they are got a lead foot. I know my brother's got one. Like I said, I do the Matt Transit thing, but because they have a lead foot or because they are good in video games, <laughs> that they think that they should be able to run your, uh, that they should be able to race in your cars. And we all know that while that some of those motor skill coordination may be the same in some of those video games, it's not the same as your sons learn as actually driving those cars at some crazy speeds that are almost 200 miles an hour. That is true. I will tell you, the first time my son did a professional testing, I never drove my car over 80 miles an hour again. To see what really goes into how we take our lives into our own hands and other and could cost other people their lives by speeding, um, I have a whole new level of respect for what a car is capable of doing and what it's not capable of doing unless it's designed to do those things. So <laughs> I do. I get phone calls. I had this one young lady, and I really, really like this young lady. And, you know, she, um, you know, she expressed how, how much she loved the sport, and, you know, she never thought that anybody that looked like her would be involved in the sport, and she just wanted to know where could she start. And she made the one mistake of sending me a video of her racing on the street in her car, and I refused oh. to open it. She, she oh. was like, did you see my video? Did you see my video? I said, no, I'm not going to look at your video. And she goes, but why? Well, why? You know, I took all day to film this, and I said, I said, do you understand that you took, not only did you jeopardize your life, but you jeopardized a lot of the people that are on the road. And you have no idea what it takes to really keep a car at that rate of speed on the ground safely. So, no, I will not support that video. And she was offended, but, you know, we spoke about it in depth, and she understood what I was saying to her. Wow. So I make it a point to let people know, please do not send me of you speeding and doing all kind of crazy antics on the road because you're not only jeopardizing your life, you're jeopardizing somebody else's life. All it takes is one person that sees you speeding up on them to panic and make a certain jerk move. They may flip their car. They may slam on a brake and you hit them or you, you – anything can happen. But you yeah, actually thought, yeah, because I actually thought about this last week. There was an incident here in Durham, North Carolina, where there was somebody um, – it was one of those – unfortunately community killings and things of that nature and the person had been hit by i think from what i was told by people hit by a motorcycle so uh, one of the local motorcycle groups decided to basically do a salute uh, down a major thoroughfare exactly the thoroughfare in front of the hat center and they were driving ba- back and forth around I, I guess as a salute to this person that had passed and everything but they were also cutting off cars and everything and all i could think of oh, was yeah, y'all are just a, y'all are just a wreck waiting to happen right exactly, exactly. Mhm. They exactly. don't understand. I lost my. It's it's ironic, but I lost my dearest dearest childhood friend the same day my son had his first motorcycle crash on the track. My friend was killed. Um, a driver cut him off, and he was killed 11:30 that morning. Mm. And my son took mm. his first spill, first ever ever crash, at 4:30 that afternoon at 160 miles an hour. And my son, I told him, I said, Michael saved your life because my son got up without a bruise, a scratch, and he flew. His body tumbled 200 yards. His bike tumbled probably three or 400 yards. But he hit the he hit the grass. And anybody racing knows once your body hits the grass, it's like Somersault City. And my son got up without a scratch on him. And that's why, you know, I'm adamant that I will not allow my children. They're, yes, they're grown and, you know, they do all kind of crazy sports and stuff like that. But I refuse as a parent to sit there and worry about them on a motorcycle because pedestrians, pedestrians and other car, you know, drivers don't respect them. Sometimes they get a, a you know, I think they get a kick out of seeing them, you know, go down because, you know, they're, bullying them on the road. You know, this road racing is very serious in our country. I agree. Yeah, but don't you think motorcyclists, um, you know, use the fact that they can dodge in and out of traffic? And, and I've seen them do, do very unsafe yeah, things on the road oh, yeah. as they're well. Double. I think it goes both ways yeah. is what I'm trying to say. Oh, it does. It does. It does. It definitely does. They, I've seen them do some crazy things, and I'm like, you have no idea. All you need to do is hit that hit some gravel and hit an oil slick and it's bye-bye city. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Right. But it's not, it's, it's not just the motorcyclists. I've also seen just regular bicyclists, and I talk about adult bicyclists as well as kid bicyclists that do some really haphazard things that you're amazed by. And I'm just amazed oftentimes at the folks, particularly that are re- driving these kind of vehicles, particularly even some of those that are driving for, like, those frame cars is what I call them. They don't have any, like, uh, hood on them and everything. But these people are, like, driving without any kind of helmets, and that always just shocked me, the fact that they – do this first without a helmet, and two, that they don't think that if this wind up being a crash, that there's a good possibility that there's going to be some severe injury, injury, if not death. So I'm just amazed sometimes at the attitudes that people have when they are actually on these various kinds of vehicles, particularly the smaller frame kind of vehicles. Yeah, people are reckless. They are definitely reckless. In this day and age, people feel like they can just do what they want to do and the hell with everybody else. Well, that's true. I think also, though, to tell you the truth, like cars, you know, have such sensitive gas pedals now and they're so smooth. I mean, sometimes I'm driving on the highway and before I know it, I say, oh, my God, I'm going like 80 miles an hour. And like, I don't even know it. Yeah. The car is so smooth and the, the gas pedal is so sensitive. So you have to really be, and that's where mindfulness comes mindful. in. You have to really be, yep. mindful to be mindful and present in the moment all the time. That's what happens. We we kind of, you know, lose that, and then that's when accidents happen. Yeah. Well, that's that's the time with my kids. That, that, you know, they we we had this saying that they got it from their mama because you know I love. I wish I wasn't as thick in the hips as I am because I would love, love, love to race with my sons. And we've discussed me running their last amateur race, but I don't know if I could put down my cheeseburgers. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know if it's going to happen. <laughs> but um, we, we have discussed me running their last amateur race with them and ushering them into the professional level. So we'll see. We have, to, Like I said, we have a lot of exciting things coming down the pipeline that we've been working on and developing and critiquing so that when we do bring it to the public, um, you know, it's it's definitely going to set the bar. Oh, now, as a cool. car, now as a person that does uh, car driving and everything, are you oftentimes worried at all about some of the new changes in the industry? Because, like she just said, a lot of cars are becoming almost self-driving, and after a while, we might even start having the roads being self-driving or self-moving. So, as as an industry, are you ever afraid that we're going to get to that part of like almost like the Mad Max kind of environment where cars aren't needed as much as they've been in the past because we're such a car-driven society. Oh, no, I'm, I am really um, – that's another thing that we want to set is innovation. And I'm involved with tech companies, um, solar companies, you know, to develop new, new products and new opportunities within the industry. So, no, I'm interested in seeing, you know – what we can bring to the table as far as an IP into NASCAR. Yeah, because that would be really good. I think we are not responsible enough as drivers and consumers for these self-driven vehicles. I don't believe in that just yet. I think it would, we would, they would have a more successful um, project if everybody was doing it. But you just have some people that are not going to respect another driver no matter what. Everybody's in a rush. And people have no problem with cutting somebody off and causing a wreck and keep going. They run over people and they keep going. So I think that that lack of respect is what makes it dangerous on the road, whether it's a a driven car or a self-driven car. I just think that that lack of respect just transcends across everything, and it makes it dangerous on the roadway. Yeah, we just did we just need to be in a rush in general because, like I said, I'm even thinking about, like, the race into space because I want to say that it was either today or recently that they were finally supposed to have that first uh, privatization to Mars and everything. But I'm sitting there going, like, well, one, are we going to make it there? Two, are we going to be able to survive there? And three, are we going to have industries, like, are we going to have, a, like, a whole basketball league in the, up there? And are we going to have, like, car racing on the moon? Who knows? And what's four? Four is can you get back? <laughs> yeah, that's the, yeah. that's the most important <laughs> thing. That is the most important but thing. But bring you back. <laughs> exactly. Well, I think we still got a few more minutes, but I don't want to try to leave. I think I have one more guest, and this might be my point, friend. Uh, do, do we have somebody else on the line? We sure do. We have Miss Ashley Harris. Welcome to Straight Talk with Dana Marr. Hey. Hey, Ashley. Hey. Glad to have you here. Glad to have you here. Ashley, we've been talking to a variety of guests. We've got... Uh, Melissa, who is the uh, 
owner of a NASCAR team. So she's the owner of a NASCAR team. We've got Phyllis Amon, who's an advocate for the elderly. And we've also uh, got uh, other guests on as well. So uh, if you just tell us a little bit about your – oh, Stafford, who's, of course, the head of Black Santa. So if you just tell us a little bit about your poetry background, because you're the like, spoken word person for the day. So I hope you've got a point that deals with the elderly or entrepreneurship, because I definitely want to hear one of your pieces before we get out of here, and I've still got about 20 minutes. Okay, cool. So, I, my name is Ashley Harris. I graduated from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill with a major in chemistry and Hispanic culture and literature with a minor in creative writing, uh, a.k.a. poetry. So, I do page poetry and spoken word. And I have a book out called If the Hero of Time Was Black, published by Weasel Press. You can find it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And... I'm part of an organization called Here and After, and we're having our open mic the 25th of March from 6.30 to 8 at Flyleaf Books in Chapel Hill. Yep. Uh, Appreciate that. And definitely we'll have to have people come and check it out and everything. Now, what was the title of your book again? If the Hero of Time Was Black. As in your mind, what would happen if the hero of time was black? Because we have Stafford who's got a black Santa Claus, but if the hero of time was black, what are some of the highlights of what this might be? What would be some of, some of the highlights? Uh-huh. Well, I mean, if the hero of time was black, I feel like he would just have a harder time in general being the hero. And I feel like his descendants would have a harder time... I chose the Hero of Time because the Hero of Time is the timeline origin of the other heroes. Because there's there's multiple links in the uh, game timeline. Oh yeah, definitely. And that makes and sense. And we yeah yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Now, uh, actually, uh, what's one of your favorite points? Because like I said, I've got about 15 minutes, and I definitely wanted to give, have you on so that you can tell people about your event that's coming up. But I also I always love having our poets give some poetry. And if you've got anything either about entrepreneurship or about, uh, and I know you're young, but about growing old or some of what you've dealt with at UNC, any points along those lines would be appreciated. Okay, so you said my favorite poets. That's, that was one of the points. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, my favorite poet is Nikki Fenny right now, and I really like Natasha Trussell. Um, uh, I always, I always hate it's so funny every time I'm asked this question, I like pause, I'm like, oh, uh. um, Lucille Clifton, I've been reading a lot of her, Yusuf Komanyaka. Yeah, I like I like those poets. Oh, oh my God, how could I forget? Audrey Lord is really good. Oh yeah, um, yeah Audrey's a, Audrey's yeah. amazing. Amazing. And what are like, and who are some of your own? What are some of your own favorite poems? Like some of your personal favorite poems of your own? I know you do that great poem uh, about going to a PWI, a predominantly white institution. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of my favorite, well, it's not my, <laughs> it's retired, but I think one of my favorite was Savages because it felt like that was my way of getting out of that situation where I was, ha- I had a roommate that was racist and I had to move out even though I didn't do anything wrong. So writing a poem called Savages, it helped me compartmentalize what I was going through. Um, even though I, I feel like back then I didn't really have words for what was happening to me. So if you're interested, so I'd love to hear that poem. If you have oh, that yeah. poem memorized, if you have that poem memorized, if you have another poem that you want to share, we'd love to hear one of your poems. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to do this poem. I wrote this poem a few days ago. It's called, If I Was You. They say, if I was you, I would. That what I do with my body is wrong. Make themselves guess in my mind that won't go home. They like it better in my limbs than in their own. If I was you, it's deja vu. What Marion Sims said he would do if he had our womb. 
support from us to show wealthy white women wore them healthier. Someone put their hands through my curls and said this would look so good on me, like my head was a styrofoam bulb at a beauty shop.